Hey guys, it's Awesome A, and it's been a while since I've talked about multiple cartoons all at once. It was one of my favorite genres on this channel that I just didn't know what to add on about anymore, but I realize I have missed a crucial era in the cartoon realm that happened between and after all of the best cartoons started slowly reaching their end and end of their peak, and this era is known as the hit or miss cartoons. These are the cartoons that had slowly started popping up that seemed to not make as much of an impact compared to these other huge ones every he loved at the time, and I had always personally thrown them to the side when listing off the best 2010s cartoons. And that's not to say this isn't common or hasn't always happened, because it has. I don't think everything in every media that comes out needs to be a sensation to be liked or talked about as is, but I do think it's interesting that all of these came out near the same rough patch of time and all had a huge switch up. They went from overly hated to now talked about as underrated hits. I want to get to the bottom of why these cartoons were so easy to brush off and not pay attention to when some of them were actually pretty fun and almost as good as the other loved cartoons, we just didn't realize it at the time. I do remember checking up on some of these cartoons and enjoying them a little bit, but I was also admittedly a bit of a sheep and I followed what everybody else thought. I feel like once the top cartoon horsemen of the 2000s and 2010s started ending, we started getting into this weird territory of studios trying desperately to throw anything at the wall, and it was either kind of working or not at all working. You you had Apple and Onion, Uncle Grandpa, and maybe even a bit of Clarence where people had a hard time warming up to them because they all kind of seemed to embrace the bad aspects of cartoons people were already hating on like Teen Titans Go and unnecessarily chaotic brain rot looking scenes and in my opinion a lot of them just looked ugly. I was not willing to sit down and watch a cartoon with a character that looks like this. And then on the almost working cartoon side you had Wee Bear Bears, Over the Garden Wall, and OKKO OK that seemed close enough to being up there with the greats but never hit the mainstream enough or the concepts of the show just weren't as universal to hit those spots. Definitely with Over the Garden Wall, which felt like a classic and was so unique in its own right, but that can sometimes do the opposite effect and can scare off cartoon viewers that just want to see some slice of life also known as me. Today we're going to be focusing on and reviewing the top four cartoons that were the hardest for people to warm up to. I've decided to watch as many episodes as I can of them to come up with my feelings of why they may have been disliked at first and discuss what I do think is true about the negativity, but also what I think the positives are of these cartoons and just all around pray I don't suffer. I hope I actually like these cartoons, otherwise the whole point of this video is ruined. We're starting off with Cartoon Network's 2013's underground hit Clarence. This one's first because surprisingly it's a show I started watching that gave me the idea to make this video. It was only last summer when I saw a clip of this show where Clarence is like, their fries are good, their burgers are good, and the soda pop is really good. Where I was like, okay, maybe I do finally need to watch this whole show. That line delivery is so satisfying. I had known this cartoon existed since it came out, but I had always thought it was too silly. Based on the opinions and reaction to it online, it had pretty much the same reaction Uncle Grandpa had when that came out, where it was like, oh yeah, judging by the look of this show, this is probably gonna be dumb. People weren't a big fan of the style of it. It looks like if Steven Universe was grotesque. A lot of people thought there was just gonna be potty humor and that Clarence was gonna be dumb for the sake of comedy only, but after seeing that clip I had to watch a full episode. Because judging by that, Clarence came off more oblivious and optimistic and had this fun perception of the world rather than just being disruptive for no reason. He's like your cousin that comes over and sure they're loud and a bit insane, but they're also the one that makes you feel comfortable to have fun and be yourself, and the cleverness that comes with their loudness cancels it out. And I was finally convinced that this show was probably more relatable and realistic than just, hey, look at this kid being silly. He likes hamburgers. Ha <laughs> And after I realized my injustice towards the show, I went to HBO Max to give it a try. I got to watch like five episodes before they took it off, coincidentally the next day. I am serious. I don't know if they have it back on there. I don't have HBO Max anymore, but F you HBO Max for that. Taking off a show the day after I started watching it is actual spite. They are watching me. I was surprised that I actually really enjoyed this show. I watched an entire season more and started watching season two as I've been writing this. I feel so terrible for not giving Clarence a chance because if I like it now as a 18 year old, I probably would have loved it even more when I was like 10. I would have placed this into my casual Digimon, Phineas and Ferb, and Jesse viewings. Clarence has some surprisingly smart storylines and character moments that I did not expect. The first few episodes do such a good job in introducing him. Clarence, who I had assumed was gonna be a chaotic, hard to sit through character, is chaotic, don't get me wrong. 
but he's wholesome, chaotic, and it just works so well. And his hyperness is balanced out with the other characters, especially Jeff. Jeff is the complete opposite to Clarence. I also recognized his voice instantly as the nerdy kid from the Goldbergs. I almost think the show would have worked just as well if Jeff was the main character. Yes, that's kind of a stretch, but I love the exploration of this dynamic of this one kid whose sole purpose is having fun, and then this other kid whose sole purpose is learning about the solar system and being a good student. And it shows how both of them are doing just fine in their own ways. It shows that difference and enjoyment for people depending on their personalities. Both of them are doing right by themselves. And throughout the show, and the more Clarence and Jeff are together, the more their personalities start to collide, which is amazing writing. Jeff goes from being a germaphobe and kind of controlling to then sitting on dirty surfaces and letting loose more often. And Clarence becomes more respectful of boundaries. I'm just kidding. What is he doing? Before I say anything else, I do have to say that this show might have the most perfect intro and outro combo in Cartoon Network's history. The theme song King of the World and the montage sets you up for what's to come perfectly. It has all that childlike energy. And then you get Clarence slamming his face into the camera, breaking the fourth wall, but also telling you exactly what this show is going to be like. It tells you exactly who Clarence is. He likes to have fun and participate, but he's also messy and clumsy and he screws things up. Up. And then you get that whole early to bed, early to rise song for the end of the episode, which does the opposite of the King of the World song. It gives this nice conclusion to each episode. It makes the episode so abrupt, but so fitting and smooth that any episode you end on, you're gonna feel like you got the wrapping up you deserve. When I hear this song, a calmness comes over me. I think Clarence has a pretty good balance of being really annoying, but very satisfying and creative with it. It's hard to explain. Like this show has humor that's supposed to be kind of obviously dumb, but the way they go about it and the way Clarence says all of these annoying things is so satisfying for some reason. You can't truly be annoyed with it and it doesn't make the show unbearable. All of Clarence's lines are catchy, his voice makes it so humorous, the voice actor does an amazing job, but it's not like these lines come out of nowhere. Whereas I'll get into it, but with a show like Uncle Grandpa, the dialogue feels more like random shouts and funny statements rather than lines that actually have a point or lead up to something. I have that gripe with a lot of cartoons and shows, for example, <coughs> Family Guy. <coughs> Clarence is really good at giving a purpose to anything over the top or ideas that seem to just be silly. Because then after Clarence's hyper excitement about the food in the first episode, we get this story about boundaries with Clarence stealing fries from Jeff. With Clarence's stubbornness and black and white thinking being young, Clarence kind of assumes Jeff won't be mad because they're friends. But he then learns the hard way that assumptions about your friends aren't always right. And just because you think someone will be okay with something does not mean you shouldn't ask and that all sparked from the silly jingle about burgers. So what I'm saying is that silliness and random humor can work, but you have to make it have a foreshadowing purpose. It can't just be for the purpose of being funny, because then you know that's what it was written for and you're being forced to find it funny. Clarence would fail in a lot of ways if his random funny phrases and lines had no overarching meaning to it all. That happens with a lot of the newer episodes of Spongebob. In the first few seasons, all of Spongebob's dumb antics ended up serving a purpose to characters later reactions or problems with him and he would then realize something different but now it feels like he's just dumb for no other reason but to be dumb and now the show is just a constant overwhelm of non-stop gags and jokes being thrown at you making them less special and less likely to have any impact Clarence doesn't rely on being gross for the sake of being gross. It does this while simultaneously capturing the child mindset and making stories out of it. Except for maybe this episode. Uh, what is going on here? I mean, there's a whole episode dedicated to Clarence and the group trying to make a girl from their school named Chelsea leave the treehouse by telling gross stories, but then she manages to battle them back with her own gross stories as well. So sure, Clarence had some ill-looking scenes, but it was all with intent. But then the episode kind of ends kind of strangely. <laughs> I'm getting off topic, but I watched an interview with the South Park creators who talked about writing in a way that ropes back to previous setups rather than a constant and then story. And I think Clarence does that pretty well. There's an episode where Sumo, Jeff, and Clarence befriend a dog and eventually need him to come to the rescue when they fall into a well. And at first when the dog throws down sticks, the characters assume the dog is just messing with them. But then they come to the conclusion that they have to build a ladder. And I love how well they do this foreshadowing setup for the characters to realize how to solve their problem. It's the bare minimum, but I appreciate it. Well, where life gives you sticks, 
You just make stick and aid. <laughs> Then you got my personal favorite episode where Clarence finds his teacher outside of school and loses his mind. I love this episode solely for the fact that I'm kind of on Clarence's side here. I remember seeing one of my elementary school teachers at like an Aldi's and I was so confused. A lot of the comedy in the show starts to follow and center around Clarence's hyper focus to find the deeper pictures and things he never thought to find the deeper picture in. Even if he goes about it wrong, the humor follows the growing up of a nine year old, realizing things and slowly slowly reaching full consciousness, he makes it his mission to go over to his teacher and find out why she exists outside of the school. And the episode not only ends with Clarence saving his teacher from this weird day, but also his family then spends time with her at the table. And it's very wholesome to see Clarence's eyes open to the fact his teacher has a life outside of what he just knows. Another thing that stands out a lot with Clarence in the cartoon universe that I think I totally missed out on is how well it portrays being a kid whose family isn't poor but isn't rich. A very normal childhood in Arizona and there isn't a gimmick to it. Clarence doesn't have 20 sisters. He's not an animal. No offense to Gumball, it works for that show. But there's always been moments where I think some cartoons and even movies take themselves way too seriously and try to be a lot more complex than they should. Like, I loved and I still love Phineas and Ferb, but there would be episodes and even the recent movie that I just had to skip because it took away all the simpleness and childhoodness of Phineas and Ferb that I wanted. One of my favorite episodes of that show is where all the kids are sick and the episode forms around that. I love little plot lines that focus on characters' personalities rather than the mission or problem they solve. And for Clarence, the show just slaps in three goofy kids exploring the world, and that's where they leave it. I'm thankful for that. Clarence is just plain childhood representation that gives it a nostalgic feeling to it now, even if I didn't grow up with the show. The night skies in this series just put me into that summer air. I love the backgrounds in this show. I don't live in Arizona, but I'm pretending this is where I live, which is the Midwest west for relatability and don't get me started on clarence's mom and how real of a character and mother she is maybe one of my new favorite mothers in media besides linda nicole watterson and the mom from luca she reminds me of my mom with her personality which that might contribute to my liking mary can be clarence's best friend and understand him on a personal level her patience is out of this world i thought we could watch all the baby big mouth movies in a row come on buddy what do you say Mom, I don't want to watch movies and talk to you about your haircut friends. I just want to be alone. That's okay. I get it. Sometimes you need some alone time just to take care of yourself and recharge the battery. <laughs> But when it comes time, she steps in to be a strict mother and keep him aligned. He still has to do chores and help her out with things. And just like the friendship dynamic with Sumo and Jeff, this works almost the same. So many relationships in the show are balanced so realistically, and I love it. It isn't one or the other when it comes to the characters. You also got her boyfriend, Chad. His character is kind of strange. He really just pops in sometimes. He mostly lurks around in the living room. But you do got the plane episode where it shows his intense fear of flying and his journey flying for the first time and i enjoy seeing the deeper side of his character he's flawed and maybe mary could find better but he does care about clarence and has almost the same amount of patience as mary but that could be more because he's almost just as weird and hyper as clarence getting back to the actual episodes sometimes clarence will occasionally stop being fun and start being weirdly dark and existential i think that's the true test to what makes a good cartoon which is a cartoon that can be really fun and silly but then hit you with emotion anytime at once it's a power that these classic cartoons have, and the impact of this is even greater because you're used to the fun and go-lucky Clarence. There's the infamous episode, which is Little Buddy, where Clarence plays too roughly with this creepy-looking doll that he is put in timeout and accidentally sits there for more minutes than he should, and in result, he ends up missing recess. And with this being his first recess he's ever missed, he doesn't like that change, and he goes into this depressive emo version of himself. You know, a kind of dark and twisted Clarence. He buries the doll, he gets rid of everything in his room, and to me it portrays how quickly one can go from being happy to a complete switch in the system. You got a Randy Newman parody which could not fit any better with this montage. This scene itself should be up there with the most well-known cartoon scenes, right up there with the dog scene in Futurama. The rest of the episode shows Clarence having to go through school days completely numb and zoned out, and when he's showing obvious signs that something's up, the school still forces him to go out and behave like all all the other kids and when he's bringing skunks and the whole school sign 
into the classroom. The only thing he is given in return is detention instead of actual help or guidance, which is so sad. But it really solidifies that Clarence as a show was able to tackle personal subjects, even if its main priority was showing the fun go lucky oblivious life of children. It still took moments and was able to represent more serious things the characters go through, such as stressing over academics, Jeff showing signs of OCD, and this episode with the fear of change. And then you got the episode In Dreams. This one is less depressing and more of an existential acid trip. The saturation, the puppet looking guy, everything about this episode visually is incredible. The episode makes you feel like you're hallucinating it. So in conclusion, yes, this show was a bit of a fever dream, absurd cartoon. But what I and many others got wrong is how well it went about doing that. And after giving it a chance, I have realized that I chose wrong in ignoring it all these years. You can really tell the show was more about exploring childhood optimism. Every episode makes you feel like you're part of Clarence's life, and it deserves to be up there with the great cartoons. Now, it's kind of hard to ignore the Clarence backstory, which is the original creator and the firing of him, but from my research, the show ended up being further continued by Spencer Rothball, who seemed to have done such a great job in making Clarence what it was, and he still talks about it very positively. Looking any deeper into a cartoon nowadays is a Russian roulette if you're gonna get a good creator or an absolute Satan spawn. Clarence did end up getting taken off the air for good after season 3. I don't know the true reason it got cancelled, but people speculate it was because of low viewership. And although I wasn't a fan when it was still running, I'm glad it didn't go on any longer and ruin its enjoyability. I forgot I have like two other cartoons I have to cover. Next on the list is Apple and Onion. This show I kind of have a bit of a backstory with, just because I started doing animated videos around the time this show came out. And the first cartoon review I remember watching on YouTube was about this show. Show, so I'm basically connected to it. I have a vivid memory of like three small animation critics discussing this show, and I don't know if I dreamed it or not, because now I really don't remember anybody actually talking that much about it as I thought I did. It's such a cartoon in the Cartoon Network catalog that isn't bad, but not really memorable enough, with nobody caring to bug it or re-spark it. But now here I am. It kind of gets a bad rep off the bat just for the character concepts alone. They're inevitable to being disliked. You know how anime and movies had this era where they only produced animal characters for a while. Well, there was a similar era for cartoons where a lot of characters had to be some sort of food or grocery store item. Maybe I'm being dramatic, but you had Pickle and Peanut. Chowder had some food characters, and you had this show, Apple and Onion, the king of the animated food universe. The character designs are definitely hard to get used to. They have this manufactured too perfect, but also not perfect at all look. And I didn't even consider this or know this was a Cartoon Network show until I started working on this video. Just because of how stylistically it falls flat compared to everything else, you're telling me the same studio behind this show also put out regular show. You're lying. Visually, the show has this bluey look to it. It gives me this kind of modern mobile game cow evolution vibe. I don't think that's a bad thing though. I actually have a strong guilty pleasure liking to that style just because the shading is usually nailed down. The animation looks like it would taste rubbery and I like occasionally chewing on some rubber. So I give it a 10 out of 10 for that. The downfall with the character designs is the more you watch, the more all the characters start blending in with each other. So unless it's apple and onion or the burrito, you start to merge all the characters together, and because of that, none of them become that important to the overall world, which is probably why this show wasn't talked about. There's not a lot that offers any type of fandom, but maybe that's not what they were going for. Apple and Onion is not like other cartoons. It's very much a fun for the sake of fun series that seems like it wasn't made to be part of the iconic character story pile on purpose which actually does it a favor because it cements itself for me at least as a comfort show you can turn on and let your mind rest. There's not any mental preparation that goes into watching Apple and Onion, other than maybe having to hear that intro song that is really bad, but maybe catchy enough to be the only thing that follows you to death. Imagine you're about to die and the last thing you hear in your mind is Apple and Onion having lots of fun. Instead of being deep, the show really pushes personality. There's this deadpan, very expected, but funny because it's expected humor. And I'm so happy they at least hit the jackpot with this. Sometimes they go as far as having actual political and societal comments that come out of nowhere and are so fast and well-paced that they end up working. My arm hurts whenever I do this. 
Well, then don't do that. That will be $300, please. You got voice acting from Richard Ioadi, who plays Onion. He's probably becoming one of the most recognizable voices in animation. And he was perfect for Onion, whose whole gimmick is this oblivious joke stating, where he kind of says things robotically and monotonely, but that's what makes it humorous. It reminds me of why Baymax worked. All the things that come out of Apple and Onion's mouths are layered in this oblivious, innocent tone, and it's great. <laughs> Oi, what's wrong with you? I'm in love. With who? The Queen of England. The humor fits the animation and style perfectly. This type of comedy was meant for this show. And going back to that instead of deep part, I want to scratch that because there are still really good morals and messages the show portrays. Despite that aspect not being at the forefront, no cartoon can be a Bojack Horseman, and it would be weird if it was, but you have episodes about having fun for the sake of fun and not for the sake of attention or to be the funnest, which is a great message for all ages, definitely regarding social media. There's an episode where Onion gets fed up with Apple's loss of focus, but then Onion realizes Apple can utilize this to sing a song that in doing so helps him focus and get things done, which is perfect. I love that. And then you got the second episode, which is about Apple adopting a cat and Onion getting jealous and worried he's losing the friend he finally got. This episode does not have much of a message, but I did like seeing Apple play with a cat. That was wholesome. A lot of people compare this show and the show's comedy to being a watered down version of Smiling Friends, Don't Hug Me I'm Scared, and a little bit of Gumball. And I can see it, definitely in the voice cadences. I love characters who don't sound interested, but are still obviously interested. Where lines will feel like dramatic statements, even though it's just them saying normal words and I love that energy. What sucks about Apple and Onion for me that doesn't allow it to be in the same league as Clarence or any of those cartoons besides the visual quality differences is the fact that Apple and Onion will go back and forth from being really strong with brutally honest humor, episode plots that are simple but super creative. They take things such as Apple wanting to be tall or Apple and Onion doing anything they can to go on a trampoline, Apple and Onion deciding they need to have a dream so their lives go somewhere, and they turn those ideas into 11 minute episodes that never overstay their welcome, and constantly pile on more meanings and gags to these ideas, but then at the same time they will throw an apple and onion singing a song every few minutes, and it takes a lot of my enjoyment away, because the songs tend to feel like filler and the easiest route to stretch out the runtime. Most of the songs are just apple and onion repeating the same lyrics five times, and sure it's obviously intentional and it's supposed to push the quirky side of the characters. The point is that they cannot sing and they're taking themselves so seriously, even though they look goofy. I get that, that's funny, but I do think these parts are way too long. They will go on for like three minutes even when you can tell they've run out of anything to add to the song. And sure, the songs do have kind of that don't hug me I'm scared feel, but what made the songs work in don't hug me I'm scared was the approaching darkness, and it feels like this show on the other hand has songs just to have songs. Then again, I don't know the target audience Apple and Onion was made for. It could have been made solely for kids in mind, and maybe they didn't feel a need to make any of the songs actually deep or clever. Although I don't love the songs or the music in this show, it isn't something that makes it too annoying or unbearable to watch. It doesn't take me out of the experience like the oversaturated dance scenes in Teen Titans Go does, and I give points for that. And at the end of the day, after checking out this show, I love how this series threw everything at the wall, and some of it stuck, and some of it didn't. And to me, that makes the show very personal, and definitely a love child to the creator. Apple and Onion sure has a bitmoji uncanny look to it, but there's so much heart and great pacing and character choices. Similar to Clarence, there's so much more than just the art style and random humor that I think warranted more eyes on it. But again, the downside with animated shows is that of course the animation is going to be the deciding factor on if people watch it or not. I'd be a hypocrite if I said it wasn't. There are countless cartoons out there that I will never watch because I cannot take the style. I lurked on the creator's social media pages and it looks like he had such a good time making this show. He even did the voice of Apple and I couldn't tell he wasn't a trained experienced voice actor because he hits it out of the park. Whenever I'm shouting things, I make sure I do an Apple impression now. I love British people. And he announced a couple years back Cartoon Network canceled the show after they put out the last couple episodes. And those were all made before it got canceled, which means they were never able to get a proper ending like Clarence did. According to people on the internet, the show failed because of its unknown target audience. And the back and forth between being a children's show and a show semi-aimed at adults also so I just started watching the second season, and I guess it becomes less about random Apple and Onion shenanigans, and more about them being losers and slowly hating each other. 
I don't know yet, but what? It's time to talk about the GOAT, the greatest character of all time, the genius that is the show, Uncle Grandpa. This guy was the enemy of 2010 cartoons. He's probably the founding father when you think of bad cartoons, or at least one of the most heavily judged cartoons. I remember the sheer mention of his name would send eight-year-old me into a coma. I had refused to check out this show. I thought I was too cool. And for more than 10 years, I have been under the notion that there was no redeemable qualities of a good morning yelling Uncle Grandpa who sounds like a voice impression your brother found out he could do and reminds you he can do it every other week. But for this video, I was able to sit down and watch episodes and it made me realize that maybe I really have no sense of quality because I was actually entertained by the episodes I watched. I did eventually give up when I realized there's five seasons of this show. I swear I thought this show was like a limited series. Apple and Onion and Clarence only have two to three seasons. But I guess this show had an unknown audience big enough for them to make 153 episodes. Perhaps we treated oddballs too harshly. Do I think this show is good? Compared to Clarence and Apple and Onion, I would choose those any day over this. But it also brought me to an even more conclusion that even if something's kind of bad, I can still sit down and consume it as if it's good. Watching the episodes, I was like, what is going on? None of this has any meaning. But I still sat sat down and watched it and I wasn't bored and I think there's a sense of style to this show the more you watch it that makes it less abnormal and more aligned with an early internet animation aesthetic. There's almost a comic book look to it that made me go, maybe this would have worked so much better as a comic, because that's what a lot of these episodes feel like. They are just stretched out comic ideas. Okay, scratch that. Uh, apparently they did make Uncle Grandpa comics. Uncle Grandpa follows this lovable fella named obviously Uncle Grandpa, whose main role is being almost a father figure to people all around the globe. He shows up like a genie and helps them out with whatever they're going through. In one episode, he helps a girl get her license and get over the fear of driving by convincing her she can drive him. And for some reason, a crazy baby is following them. I don't know who's coming up with this. Joking aside, it's a really nice episode. What's also notable to point out is half the things Uncle Grandpa fixes for these nephews, he caused himself. I know everybody online has had this Uncle Grandpa did nothing wrong, y'all just hated him for no reason switch up, but I do need to point out how in episode 8, he eats this kid's cardboard school homework, and when the kid tells him to stop and lets him know that he's eating his homework, Uncle Grandpa then does it more. He is not the angel you guys think he is. And then he gaslights the kid saying how much he felt bad. No, you did not feel bad. He almost cried to you and you kept chewing. I get it, Dennis. I ate your homework and I feel really bad about it. The characters in the show include Pizza Steve voiced by Adam Devine. This guy hired an acting agent whose specific role is casting him in the most random media they could find. This guy was in the last Ice Age for some reason. He played Sam I Am. Whenever he's not acting, he shows up in game shows. You never know when he's gonna appear, maybe in your dreams. Then you got giant realistic flying tiger who I now know by memory because Uncle Grandpa mentions her name every three seconds. She's just the PNG of a tiger and it very much tells you when this show was created. They should have slapped in a Perry Grip song every time she appeared while they were at it. But that being said, she is one of the best characters, and I think it does offer to the personality of the show. I do have a bit of nostalgia for random real images showing up in cartoons. It definitely goes to show how much Gumball had an impact in the future of Cartoon Network shows. Then we got my favorite character, Mr. Gus. This is who they should have centered the show on because anytime this show actually has some meaning that's understandable, it's because of him. I am a sucker for a deadpan sort of negative character, but not with any malicious intent. There's an earlier episode where they leave Gus out of a funny face party because they don't believe he's funny, and he leaves devastated, and I felt for him. He spends the whole episode in his room until it's revealed that he did that to help them stay serious and defeat the funny face monster that shows up. What a guy. Uh, that being said, I have absolutely no idea what's happening in this episode. I don't know who in the writer's studio thought this was actually funny, because there's no reason for any of this to be happening. My hands physically clenched up watching this episode. I was so uncomfortable. That being said, I am a little bit hesitant to talk about my complaints of the show, because they're too obvious, and hate for this show is old news. I've given up on constantly hating on the Loud House and Teen Titans Go, because they're such easy punching bags that I don't want 
want to talk about them or Uncle Grandpa negatively like I'm saying anything people haven't heard already. But at the same time, this show half the time does not make up for its existence. Someone in the process of making the show was like, guys, how funny would it be if I slapped on a wig and stuck my tongue out? The best way to describe this show is that it's another cartoon by people who just want to create something, literally anything. I refuse to believe there wasn't at least one animator working on this show who didn't think for a second, wait, what are we animating? What is this episode about? Like, how do you describe these scripts to the people working on the show? Contradicting myself, the deeper and the more you watch the episodes, the more the absurdness of the cartoon starts to become normal. You get used to it, and the episodes do become less random. Mr. Gus gets a lot more screen time, and he becomes more acceptable of how weird his friends are. And I think that's very nice character development. The show is actually adding a little bit more emotion and self-awareness to it, and even starts to insert some actual unexpected jokes that make you double take and I kind of cracked a few giggles and I didn't even realize it uh, one of my favorite jokes is in the scared of the dark episode because it's the first joke in the show that actually came as such a surprise to me why did they make uncle grandpa say this too scary too random maybe later maybe later I will now be using the rest of this segment to talk about one of the best cartoon crossovers of all time maybe unironically the best which is Say Uncle from Season 2 of Steven Universe. This episode not only has some incredible references to the internet, the perfect use of both universes' characters, but it also kind of justifies Uncle Grandpa's existence even further by using the episode to kind of be a metaphor for people that don't like Uncle Grandpa and Steven Universe. Even if it wasn't on purpose, it kind of made me feel bad for ever hating Uncle Grandpa. The episode starts with Steven unable to access his shield powers, and that's when it's the perfect chance for Uncle Grandpa's appearance. The Gems question Uncle Grandpa's morals and believe he's going to corrupt Steven. Keep in mind, it's stated by Uncle Grandpa himself that this is not canon. And then he whips out a real canon. What a jokester, what a legend. The interactions in this episode feel so natural and the transitions into the fourth wall breaks are so well. They use visual gags from Uncle Grandpa, such as Uncle Grandpa's head flying off of his body and they utilize that with the other characters perfectly. Lots of the humor in this episode revolves around how strange Uncle Grandpa is to the Crystal Gem. And as they chase Uncle Grandpa away, Uncle Grandpa and Steven Universe then teleport into the world of Uncle Grandpa. Now Steven is in the Uncle Grandpa Universe. Steven and Uncle Grandpa bond over the fact that they both have a history with RVs. We then get an incredible joke about how Pizza Steve is actually the coolest Steve. And then Steve gets a side plot with Amethyst. All of these interactions are balanced to a T. Mr. Gus gets to shine as basically a Steven Universe fan. And he literally draws his own gem Sona. This cannot get get any better. Marvel needs to bow to the superior multiverse, and we can't forget flying realistic Tiger's role in this episode where she enjoys a tea party with Lion. Eventually, with Uncle Grandpa back on the island, the gems are now set on destroying him once and for all, and in the end, Steven Universe has to let them know that Uncle Grandpa's just different, and just because they don't understand him doesn't mean they should attack him. They should give him a chance. It honestly made me emotional. I changed my mind on Uncle Grandpa being annoying or lacking meaning. This man was just trying to teach us that it's okay to be weird. That was the meaning all along. Also, if you think this episode could not get any better, it ends with a list of all the other cartoon characters Uncle Grandpa has met. And last on his list is Clarence. You're telling me we could have had a Clarence Uncle Grandpa episode. Although I probably will never watch this show again after this video is uploaded. It really could be a lot worse. I'd much rather an ugly looking cartoon than a forgettable one. I'm a big believer in the fact that we should allow cartoons to just be fun sometimes and that fun doesn't automatically equal immature although for this show maybe it does but i've stated in the past that we don't need something spectacular and completely artistic all the time sometimes it's okay for us to give a show that just wants to be insane and that's it a chance also i'll never forget when the show got taken off of hbo max and in response the creator posted this hi i'm blake's place niche internet micro celebrity and this awesome sway or whatever this guy's name is video is my property now so from around 2013 to about 2019 or someone consider to this day would people say nickelodeon to be in its flop era making huge classics such as sanjay and craig harvey 
Peaks, The Barnyard Animated Show, and Breadwinners, which I'm going to talk about right now. So Breadwinners is an animated Nickelodeon show, a Nicktoon if you will, which ran for a total of two seasons with the highest rated episode being a 5.1 on IMDb and the whole show being rated a solid 2.7. So. It's a sign of greatness if I've ever seen one. The show kind of became the breaking point in the Nickelodeon flop era, the most punched of punching bags, the locale of Nickelodeon shows. For example, Watch Mojo Top 10 Worst Nickelodeon Cartoons of All Time, number 6, Bre Breadwinners, who could have guessed? A sign of absolute quality is when your show's episodes are uploaded onto YouTube in full in 720p. But like, how's the show? Is it actually as bad as people say? Does it actually live up to the awful reputation that it has? Well, basically, breadwinners is what you get when you want to write the success of something like Gumball, but have no idea what made Gumball good. Just by looking at the animation in the intro, you can definitely tell what the main inspiration was. The character designs itself, like these monsters that show up in the intro, look exactly like the monsters from Gumball, you know, that live in the forest. Um, the mixed media animation is also something that Gumball usually does to achieve this kind of thing. It's this kind of surrealist and let me say quirky kind of vibe but breadwinners just uses it like every other scene it overuses it so much to the point where it does get old pretty quickly the humor can be described as random out of pocket fast paced some would say the writing of the jokes i gotta say are well lazy let me list everything that breadwinners has up its sleeve real quick slapstick humor a character talking too loudly some kind of visual gag literally just random stuff happening or or just a skit like how family guy just cuts away to a gag basically however speaking as a person who has a mind of a five-year-old every broken clock is right twice so sometimes you do get a chuckle or two watching this show but the overall experience is just so numb, so stale, just grating to watch most of the time. Because this show just bombards you with the same joke or the same visual gag or the every like two seconds. So I can't really recommend to catch up with the hit show Breadwinners. But if you happen to be a 30 year old mom watching this with two kids that have ADHD, you can throw this on while you have a nap or something. Uh, to close out my segment in this video, which was unnecessarily long, I'm going to read you the most dramatic IMDb review I have ever read, titled Don't Like It by user Lucky Lucky 1798 <clears throat> As of 2010, I'm anti-Nickelodeon. Yes, that sounds stupid, but look at it this way, dot dot dot. Both Fairly Odd Parents and Spongebob were airing for 10 plus years now, and all their new shows I do not like, not even the 2012 TMNT or Korra. I'm sorry to say, but this show is not doing Nickelodeon any favors, but at least some people like the 2012 TMNT and the Korra show are okay with me. Breadwinners, stray away from it, like, do not watch it at all. In the year of 2014, there's so many other good shows out there. Good shows equals better than Breadwinners. <laughs> if you're watching Nickelodeon and Breadwinners comes on, change the channel. I hear the Cartoon Network has a few good shows on now. Thank you, Blake, for that. And that wraps up today's video. I feel like we're in a time where we've had a split since the overly hated cartoon time of 2013 to 2017. Now we have people that are giving shows and media a chance after so long thanks to someone going, wait, this wasn't that bad on social media, and then it's a snowball effect from there. But we're also living in a repeat of that cartoon judging time, where every new thing coming out has to prove itself more than ever. And we're getting basically the same reaction we got with these cartoons, but now with Pixar and other studios. I do think it's totally okay to be hesitant about movies and shows. Media still has to prove itself. We're living in a time with Madam Web and Morbius and 1000 remakes that of course we're gonna be more skeptical of new content. But at the same time, unless you know for certain something's gonna be bad you never know if you're gonna be right and sometimes you get surprises it's happened countless times where something i thought would suck off the bat ends up being unexpectedly really good and then it's even more ironic because things you think will be good probably won't be you just never know so my message to myself and to anybody watching is to give things a chance before deciding yeah it's ugly it's gonna be dumb or cliche because if you let that go then we end up getting to see Clarence, the Lego movie, Barbie, or anything else we thought would be bad but weren't. I don't know where I was going with this. I'm gonna be trying to upload a lot more. I've been busy with procrastination, but that's over and I'm excited for the summer content. Another fun video coming really soon. Okay, stay awesome.